Thank you so much to Beacon College for inviting me here tonight. Um, thank you all for coming out on such a cold evening. Um, it is single digits in Omaha, Nebraska, where I live. So I, I would say that I feel your pain, but I don't really feel your pain. <laughs> it's lovely out there. So, um, so yeah, tonight we are going to talk a little bit about quackery. Um, this is a book that actually was written by uh, myself as well as Nate Peterson, who is a librarian and journalist, and he lives up in Idaho. And several years ago, we came together and got this idea for writing a book about all the strange and bizarre ways that we used to try to cure ourselves throughout history. Some of the ones that we could all generally agree were pretty outlandish and not a good idea. Um, Nate and I fought over <laughs> which chapters we would write, and they ended up falling along the lines of he picked things that he thought was really interesting, like light, magnetism. <laughs> he loves beer, so he took the alcohol chapter. I am a practicing physician of internal medicine at the University of Nebraska, so I tended to go towards the subjects of surgery and anesthesia, opium, arsenic. I love chemistry. So it was a really fun book to write and research, so I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. Daryl also mentioned that I also write fiction, so I've been writing a lot of books over the last couple of years, and they all tend to have some element of nature or science or genetics and poisons and chemistry. So uh, it's been a fun way to sort of exercise that side of my brain. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about the origin of the word snake oil and snake oil salesman. Uh, you, most of you have probably heard of this term. Whenever I have an audience that's full of middle schoolers or high schoolers, they look at me funny. They don't know what I'm talking about, but snake oil and snake oil salesmen um, harkens back to the late 1800s. Uh, so Clark Stanley was this frontiersman and quite a showboater. He created this liniment called um, his snake oil liniment, and it didn't really come from him. He kind of stole it from the Hopi tribe as well as from. Um, Chinese laborers who were working across the United States to lay down railroad. And the Chinese laborers um, had been using a snake oil liniment that was created from Chinese water snakes. So it probably actually worked a little bit. It has a very high level of omega-3 fatty acids, which have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, but when Clark's family decided that he was going to make a buck off of this concept, he didn't have any Chinese water snakes around. Um, he had rattlesnakes, because that's what we have in the United States, right? So at the big Columbian Exposition in Chicago, um, I think it was 1893, he, uh, he took out this rattlesnake, this live rattlesnake, and killed it, and he plunged it into a vat of boiling water, and a little bit of fat rose to the top, and he skimmed it off, and he mixed it into some jars of salve, and he sold it, saying it would cure anything that a salve can cure. Okay. It even says toothaches out there. I mean, who puts Ben Gay on their toothaches? I don't, I don't know. But this is what he claimed. Now, um, he made a pretty penny off of this. Um, but by the time the century turned and then we started having the early Food and Drug Administration, somebody actually took one of his jars and tested it for snake oil and snake anything. There was nothing in there that was snake containing. It had, um, uh, I think it had like lard or some sort of fat and it had some sort of pepper essence. There's no snake in there. So that is where the story originally comes from. And we can't go farther without actually discussing the word quack, which is kind of a very funny, funny word when you think about it. Um, but quack actually originates from the word quacksalver, which is a Middle Dutch word, so it's very old. Um, that means uh, somebody who boasts or brags about their salve. So it's someone on the street corner who's hawking their wares. So that's where the word um, quack comes from. Now that we have a little bit of background, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of take you on a tour of some of my favorite subjects in the book. We can't cover everything, but um, I figured we would pick some of the ones that were going to be kind of fun. They're a little 
I hope you have strong stomachs. And, you know, <laughs> Daryl told me there would be all these appetizers here, and I was like, oh, boy. I, I hope they can handle this. I will try to keep the gross to a minimum. <laughs> okay, so does anybody know what this is? It looks like a kind of knife, right? Okay, so this is called a fleam. F-L-E-A-M. It is um, a type of knife that is used in bloodletting. And as you can see, there is a notch um, right here on the blade. Not really a notch, a bump, um, right there. And that is the part that is used to jab into your, your body so that you can bleed. Um, that's actually a, a bigger one than the ones that some of the surgeons would use. They would use a lancet. Um, that knife or fleams like this can be found on eBay, apparently, and I actually thought of buying one and bringing them to my lectures until I realized the TSA would not be very happy with that, so I don't own one yet. <laughs> but it brings up the subject of bloodletting. So this is a doctored photo, they didn't have color back then, of bloodletting that happened in, in the uh, mid-19th century. So bloodletting has been done for quite a long time. And the reason for it um, stems from this concept that your blood, you know, we understand how blood is made now. It's made in your bone marrow, it circulates for about 120 days, does its job, and at some point in time, it, the cells pop and die, your spleen cleans them out, and everything's taken care of. Well, for a long time, um, people actually thought that your blood just stagnated. It was the same blood you always had, and you know, it was good to let it out. Um, if you did, you might get sick. But along with that, there was this centuries-old concept of the four humors. So we all have a really good understanding of how the human body works. Um, there's circulatory system, we've got a neurologic system, our skin is its own organ. But up until, you know, maybe 200 years ago or 150 years ago, these concepts were really foreign to people. They didn't understand how the human body worked. And there's a lot of history behind why, you know, dissections weren't able to be done and that sort of thing. But this particular theory lasted for a very long time and it started really way back to the time of Hippocrates. We're talking three, four hundred BC. Um, and so the four humors were these um, sort of essences in your body that were kept in this balance, this precarious balance. Um, they were uh, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And when they were all in balance, you were healthy. And when you were sick, one of them was <laughs> out of balance. There was too much of it, and it was causing problems. So um, now these uh, humors were also associated with many other different things. They um, associated with earth, air, water, fire, dry, cold, hot, wet, um, the different uh, seasons. And they were also associated with um, personality. So if you tended to have one or more of these humors, you might be considered sanguine, somebody um, who, let's see, sanguine, I think, is the one who's generally pretty happy. Um, There's also people who were um, uh, choleric. I always had to look these up because I can't keep them all straight. So choleric, which means you had too much yellow bile. Those were extroverted, goal-oriented, ambitious people. Um, people who were melancholic had too much black bile, and they were introverted, analytical, they feel emotions very deeply. And the phlegmatic people are calm and peaceful. So it's a pretty, it kind of makes sense. They, they, they came up with these ideas, they, they seem to uh, reflect the world around them. So we were sort of a microcosm of you know everything in nature. And um, if something's not right, if you have too much blood in your system, and oftentimes if you were sick, it was blamed on too much blood, then the way to treat it would be to bleed you. And so there were different ways that they did this. This is called a brass scarificator. It sounds like a really bad movie. Um, this is from uh, somewhere around the mid 1800s. Um, these are also available on eBay. Just you know. <laughs> um, the, the way the brass scarificator works, it's about you know uh, an inch and a half wide, 
Um, it has these spring-loaded teeny tiny blades in them. And so you hold it against your arm and you sort of um, kind of pull the trigger and these, in this case it's about 12 different tiny little blades will cut into your arm and generally you take a, a glass cup um, light it over a fire, and then you put the cup over the cuts, and that vacuum pulls the blood out. So that's that's one way to do it. I know, fun, right? Mm, not really. <laughs> um, the more common way that blood was taken when they needed to take a good pint or two or three or four, it happened many times, um, was the what they would do is they would take um, a tourniquet and put it up in your arm, and they would have you grab onto something. You, have, you know when you go to the doctor and you gotta get your blood you know, drawn, and the phlebotomist says, squeeze your hand like this, right? So what that does is that it, it, it makes a little bit more blood come into your arm, and your veins get nice and plump so you can get more blood. So squeezing onto a pole like that would allow more blood to kind of flow into the dish. Um, and for a long time, it, the person who actually did these bloodlettings, it wasn't necessarily the doctor or the physician, it was the barber surgeon. So the barber surgeon was your friendly neighborhood guy who would pull your tooth or lance of oil or cut your arm off if it was gangrenous <laughs> um, or do your bloodletting if you needed it or if the doctor prescribed it. And, um, and on the side, they could cut your hair. So. <laughs> so that was the barber surgeon. And um, they would advertise their wares by you know, putting this pole outside of their establishment with the rags that were sort of flying in the air drying. And they would be red or bloody, and they might be white. Um, and so the modern barber pole came, comes from this very old tradition um, of the barber surgeons doing this bloodletting. Um, so depending on where you are, the pole is red and white striped. Um, there's usually a, a I, there's supposed to be a little bit of a bowl underneath, you know, holding holding the pole. Um, if it's red and white, that symbolizes the red blood and the white tourniquet. If it's red, white, and blue, it's the red blood, the white tourniquet, and the blue color of the vein. So they say. Okay, so we're going to talk about another way of getting rid of blood in the body. <laughs> so Daryl mentioned the leeches. I did not bring any leeches today. Um, so this is a woodcut from 1638 that shows a woman applying leeches to herself. Now why would a person want to use leeches? The doctor says, you got to lose some blood, you got too much blood, you're not feeling well. If you're feeling a little depressed and melancholy, you would get bloodletting done. You would maybe get some leeches done. But if they thought that you were too congested, say, in your tonsils, okay, got a little tonsillitis, the doctor might say, you need a leech on there. Because, you know, when you're doing a bloodletting from an arm, you're, you're taking out a big portion of blood. But oftentimes, there was this concept that if you could treat the area that was being affected, the closer you can do the bloodletting to the area that's got a problem, the better off you are. So, for example, if you have an ear, you can't tourniquet your head and get blood from that area, so a leech might be used, okay? Now, who here has actually been bitten by a leech? Who here went wading in a creek as a kid? And, okay. Now, those of you who've gotten bitten by a leech, do you remember being bitten? No. no. Do you remember pulling it off? Yeah. <laughs> Did it bleed for a while after? Yes. Okay. So, you can see why leeches were sometimes preferred. When they bite you, it doesn't hurt. It's not really scary. It's, it's very gentle. And leeches have a natural anticoagulant in their saliva called periodin. And actually, um, modern medicine has made versions of that to use themselves. So that anticoagulant keeps the blood flowing. And it can be really, really helpful um, to get rid of the blood if somebody wants it removed from a particular place. And when I say a particular place, I basically mean any place. So I mentioned tonsils, right? So you could get a leech applied to your tonsil, but of course there's this fear, what if I choke on it, I don't want to swallow it. So they would take a thread and sew it through the end of the leech and dangle it in there, let it bite where it needed to. And when it was done, they yank it out like a bad tooth. Because um, they didn't want you to swallow it, right? <laughs> um, and they had all sorts 
sorts of tricks to get these leeches to do what they needed to do because they were finicky. So sometimes they just didn't feel like feeding, and so they would try to, they dunk it in some wine to get it drunk. Apparently it would bite better. They would nick your skin a little bit to get a little blood flowing so that the leech would, would actually bite. And I think that's still done today. Um, so, interestingly, you know, that leech was so squirmy, they couldn't necessarily just put it exactly where they needed to. So they had these were actually leech application tubes. They are glass, so you could dangle the little leech in there and get it to bite where you needed it to bite. <laughs> and that's actually a picture of a leech bite. So it has this kind of peace sign, Mercedes-Benz sign to it. You see that? Because they actually have, get this, for you know people who like details and numbers. So leeches have three jaws. That's why they have that. That's why it makes that sort of three size bite. And each jaw has like hundreds. I think it's like a thousand teeth or something like that. So we're talking about a lot of teeth to do the job. Okay. And then so. I did a lot of lectures on this subject last year, and I was kind of curious. Uh, so I went on the internet and I bought a leech as a pet. <laughs> and uh, mostly just because I wanted to be able to bring it. I was doing like a lot of visits to high schools to get the kids interested. I'd be like, hey, here's my pet leech. So I bought a leech. You can get it on the internet for like $8. It just shows up in your mailbox. It's so strange. <clears throat> Questions I get all the time, did you let it bite you? No, I did not let I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. Um, what did it eat? It ate pieces of um, beef liver. I would just throw in a little chunk of beef liver in there and it would suck on it, like, you know, um, until it, there wasn't any blood left and then it would swim around. It was kind of, it would get mad at me. It would be like, this isn't the right, it's like, it's like somebody in Texas who's like, you give them tofu, and they're just like, this is not what I want. So they would get kind of mad at me. Was, and at some point in time, it ran away, which is another story. I don't know where it is. It left my house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So it, um, we never found it. I don't know where it went. It escaped. There's actually a video on here. If we can hit the play button real quick so you can see what it looks like. And this one, this guy, he was about, like, he could be as short as an inch or as long as, like, two or three inches. And he was actually quite pretty. If you looked really close at him, he had these orange, brown, and black speckles all over. They were, they were, it was actually kind of... It was gross, but pretty. <laughs> so there he is stretching out, looking for, you know, fresh blood. And probably cussing at me because I'm not letting him bite me. So that's, that was my the story of my, my leech. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about something slightly less gross, which is gold. Who doesn't love gold? It's pretty. It's worth a lot. Humans have been obsessed with gold forever because there are limited quantities. Um, I think there's a thought that most of the gold that we actually use comes from meteors, um, meteorites, and not actually from deep within the earth. But anyway, um, you know, gold's really special. It's one of those elements that um, it, it's, it doesn't change very easily. It doesn't tarnish, as you know. Anybody who here has ever had actually like 24 karat gold uh, jewelry or something like that will notice it never tarnishes. Um, but that was actually a problem. So people thought gold is really fantastic. It looks like the sun. You know, clearly, as something as immutable as gold must be able to impart good health to you. But the problem is that if you swallow a chunk of gold, it comes out the other end completely unchanged. And people thought it's not working. So we need to figure out a way that gold can be absorbable and you can drink it and it can actually do the good thing. So this was something that alchemists actually really tried to tackle for a long time. And uh, before I get to that, so um, it, in about 1300, um, there was a, an alchemist who actually finally figured out a way to 
dissolve gold in something. So he was looking for something called aqua regia, which means royal water. And this would be this compound that could actually finally dissolve gold so you could drink it. And um, it was this toothsome potion comprised of nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. And it did dissolve the gold into gold chloride, which is what you see actually on the bottom right there. Um, so gold chloride is something that you can eat and absorb. Um, a couple hundred years later, um, there was a guy named Paracelsus who said that, well, we've got this drinkable gold now called arm potable, which means drinkable gold. The only problem is that it was absorbing gold into your system is not a good thing. Um, it can cause something called auric fever, which causes kidney problems, kidney failure, large quantities of salivation, and you know other really, really bad side effects. And so it didn't end up showing up in a lot of history because it was either too difficult to use because it wouldn't change, or when you could actually absorb it, it was too toxic. Nowadays, gold is still actually used um, for uh, certain rheumatological illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so some people may have 10 years ago or 15 years ago have gotten gold injections in their joints. Um, if you have a friend with rheumatoid arthritis, they might be able to tell you that they, they got that. Nowadays, we have much better medication, so it's rarely used. Um, and also going back to the bloodletting thing, you know, just to dip our toe into current um, practices, bloodletting is still actually used in mainstream medicine today, but for very, very narrow purposes. So people who have um, polycythemia vera, they make too much red blood cells, or hemochromatosis, they have too much iron, um, will get blood regularly, maybe once a month or once every few months, to get rid of the excess iron, excess blood, so that they don't have problems. But it's not used for everything. It's not used for like the common cold, which is kind of, <laughs> it was used for everything back then. Um, Leeches as well are also used today, but in very specific instances. So, uh, for example, let's say um, somebody cuts the tip of your nose off in an accident, and you get it sewn back on. Well, if it swells up tight enough, the circulation to that new piece of tissue that just got stitched on might close off. And so a surgeon might actually apply leech to the tip of the nose or around the nose so that um, it'll kind of decongest the area, the blood will kind of keep flowing, and the circulation to that piece of tissue will survive. So last I checked, the pharmacy at the University of Nebraska has leeches for the surgeons who need them. So again, these things are still used. Um, so like, yeah, if you get into an accident where like your finger tip gets cut off or something and it starts to swell and the doctor says, no, oh, we might lose it, you wouldn't... Don't be surprised if they suggest leeches. Still happens. Okay, so back to gold. So um, now, one of the things that is interesting about gold, because we're so enamored with its shiny specialness, is that it's very easy to use it as a quack medicine. So in the late 1800s, turn of the century, there was a guy named Dr. Keeley, and he. Um, was a physician who thought that alcoholism was a disease. He was very uh, forward-thinking in his time. Not a moral failing, but a disease. And he said, I can cure it. And he said, if you come to one of my sanitariums, he had them all over the country. And I would not be surprised that there were several in Florida. There was definitely one, a couple in Nebraska. So if you went to one of his, you know, Keeley's institutions, you could get these injections multiple times a day, and then you line up and you drink your Keeley's Gold Cure Elixir, and after a couple of weeks, you're cured, you're cured of your addiction, your opium addiction, your alcohol addiction. He claimed this like over 90% cure rate, which is not possible. But it turns out somebody snuck some of these bottles out and tested them to see if there was gold in them. There was no gold. Um, in the, the elixirs that you could send out for and mail order and get at your own home to do your own home uh, detox, um, turns out that it contained uh, cocaine, <laughs> cannabis, and alcohol. So, <laughs> so you can imagine why the people who are going through their alcohol detox are like, I feel pretty good on this stuff. <laughs> this is great. So yeah, they were cured, but you know, I guess with what is the question? Okay. All right. How are those stomachs doing? We're pretty strong. <laughs> we're ready to the next one. So we're going to talk about my favorite chapter: corpse medicine. I know. It's, it's my favorite chapter because I knew very little about it. It was such a strange concept to me. Why would you want to eat another human being to get better? It's, 
it's a weird cultural thing. Like right now, if you think, well, if you get, if you accept a blood transfusion from somebody, that's okay. If you accept a liver transplant or kidney transplant or cornea transplant, that's okay. But consuming another person is not okay. It's just an interesting thing we should think about. But so I'm not suggesting it. I'm just saying think about it. <laughs> so um, this is actually a uh, print from 1680, The Gallows at Tyburn, England. So anybody who's watched an, a movie that goes back into history knows that whenever there was an execution, there'd be this big group of people gathering because, you know, instead of the next Marvel movie or Netflix, they had executions. This is how they entertain themselves. And it was a good way of teaching people, like, don't commit crime. This is what will happen to you. Well, at these executions, oftentimes after somebody had their head chopped off or they were hung, People would go up to where the executioner was, and they would rub part of their body. Let's say they had, you know, a boil on their hand, and they would rub the boil on the hanging dead body. Yes. Or they would, um, you know, grab a cup, and if somebody's head was bleeding, they would gather some of the blood, and they would drink it. Why would they do that? So... There was this idea that these dead bodies, these fresh dead bodies, had this um, kind of magical way of healing people. They had this kind of essence in them. Um, now, it wasn't, you couldn't just eat any corpse, or you couldn't just touch any corpse. It had to be a very particular corpse. So if you were um, older, not so good. If you were female, not so good, because women were considered the, the weaker sex. Um, you had to be young, healthy, you could not have had an illness, you must have been killed quickly and suddenly so that you know all that sort of young, vigorous healthiness was like right in you at the time of death. And so where are you going to get a young, healthy person who's killed suddenly and quickly? Generally at an execution, right? And so people thought that that sort of energy or spirit that they had, that healthiness, could be transferred by touching them or drinking their blood. So that's where this sort of idea came from. Now, the executioners had a little side gig going. Um, after the, the bodies were taken down, they would sometimes harvest the human fat, and they would sell it because it was a very popular salve. So human fat was um, also called man's grease, and it was called hangman salve, um, and it was used for arthritis, rabies, all sorts of things. And these are two um, apothecary jars that you could have found in England that contains axon hominis, which is human fat. Yeah, so those are from the 17th and 18th century. So you're thinking, oh god, that was such a long ago. Who, who would do that now? Well, these are actually amples of purified human fat from the early 20th century. So I think these are from like 1905 or so. Just not that far along, <laughs> far ago. So... Okay, now we're going to talk about a different type of corpse medicine. So this is eating um, mummies, Egyptian mummies. This was a really, really popular remedy in the 17th and 18th century. Um, the idea came from kind of a word mix-up. So in the Middle East, there is this um, compound called mumia, or wax. And it was kind of um, from bitumen. It was, it was like this mineral pitch, this black greasy stuff that people would use on, with, for like poultices to put on their body or to rub in somewhere. And at some point in time, somebody like carved open a Egyptian mummy, they saw some of this black material inside the mummy, and they said, oh, this is that mumia stuff, that Persian wax that we're using. And so the words kind of became interchangeable, and people also started to think that these mummies had this magical ability to cure people if you could grind them up and put them into a medicine or an elixir or something. So mummies were really, really popular. They were considered to be, um, some of the leading physicians of the day called it the sovereign remedy. If nothing else worked, mummy would cure you. So there's another apothecary jar that says mumia, and there's a mummy seller in 1875 who's selling some mummies that they have stolen from Egypt. So poor Egypt got completely plundered. You know, the tombs got plundered. There was a huge um, traffic of Egyptian mummies being taken and sold to Europe and England to the point where it got so brisk there was actually a mummy tax. And mummy import tax, yes, absolutely. And along with popular remedies, there were also quacks. 
And so people would be like, watch out for that fake mummy. You want to get the good stuff. <laughs> so people would take like dead bodies and grind them up and be like, this is really, this is the good stuff. This is from Egypt. And it, it wasn't. And so there was a lot of discussion going on about like what was real mummy, what was fake mummy. Okay, <laughs> we're going to go on to something um, that is, I wish I could say that we left this far, far behind us, but it's opium. All right, so opium has been known for centuries. I think way back in, you know, 3000, 4000 BC is showing up in, in history. But so the op opium comes from the opium poppy. It's this beautiful flower that um, after the flower blooms and it makes this little seed pod, if you scratch the pod, this white milky latex comes out and if you collect it, it turns into this gummy stuff and that's raw opium and you can smoke it or refine it further and it has this really um, potent combination of chemicals that have um, pain, uh, the ability to take care of pain. They're pain relieving properties. And it is a pain reliever unlike any other medicine that um, you know, humans have, have found naturally. So if you think of all the horrible things that people have had to suffer from and you think about opium, you're like, you know what, that actually probably really did help people quite a bit. Especially when you consider the alternatives were bleeding, leeches, um, purgatives. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but remember the whole thing with you know, if you have too much black bile, if you're feeling a little too depressed, um, they might say, um, hey, you, you need to get rid of some of that bile. The way to do it is a lot of vomiting and a lot of diarrhea. So if you're not feeling well and someone says, would you like the purgative that's going to leave you on, you know, the outhouse for five days? Or would you like a little opium? Most people will be like, I'll take the opium. So the opium obviously has bad side effects. It causes constipation, itchiness, really bad nausea, and it's addictive. But compared to some of the other things in the day, it was somewhat gentler. Now this guy, his name, um, <laughs> his name is Philippus Aureolus uh, Theophrastus Lombastus von Honeheim, and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that. He also went by Paracelsus. He was a philosopher, an astronomer, a chemist, and he took um, opium and he mixed it with all this fancy stuff like um, staghorn and amber and musk, and he created these teeny little pellets that he called laudanum from laudare to praise. And he said, this stuff is great. He put those little tiny pellets in the pommel of his sword and he would pop them like Tic Tacs. Um, somebody thought that they looked like mouse poop. <laughs> and she's like, I don't know why you're eating the things that look like mouse poop, but he thought that they were really great. And later on in the 1800s, they further refined this laudanum um, to this elixir that could be found pretty much everywhere. You go to your grocery store and you could buy these opium elixirs. And they were used for all sorts of things, you know, obviously for pain. Um, anybody who had cramps, um, people who weren't feeling well, a little dose of laudanum for whatever ailment that they had could make them feel better. And um, Daryl also mentioned, you know, there was a large, um, there was a large market for people who use them to actually quiet their children. So you have a child who's colicky, who's teething, or is just misbehaving or just being a normal toddler. You could give them a couple of drops of opium syrup and off to Snoozeville they go. Now, a lot of times in the late 1800s, women were really entering the workforce quite a bit. So if you were having children and you needed to go work, sometimes these caretakers were taking care of four, six, eight, 12 children at a time. And it's hard to do it when they're all screaming at you. And so drop, 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 drop. <laughs> a lot of those, some of those children did die. I mean, there were deaths from, um, from these opium syrups, and it was really a, a bad problem for a while. So it became much less of a problem once you know the Narcotics Act got passed in the beginning of the 20th century. So in the late 1800s, they were recognizing that opium was a problem, laudanum was a problem. Now they had actually found the act, one of the active ingredients in opium, which was morphine, which is great, and they were using it. Um, in injectable form. Um, and it was unfortunately creating people who were, they called them morphinomaniacs. They were becoming um, addicted to morphine. And doctors were like, you know what, we need to find something that's going to take care of pain that is not going to be addictive. So the, um, the chemist at Bayer, 
a German company, they actually looked up a, a recent finding for this um, chemical formula for a medicine that was going to be a pain reliever, but that you needed far, far less. It was so potent, you only needed a tiny bit for, for pain control. And they called it um, heroin, after the German word herrisch. Again, I'm going to pronounce this all wrong because I don't know German. But it's, it made them feel heroic because they tested it on themselves and were like, I feel great on this stuff. So they touted this as a non-addictive painkiller. And it was sold in lozenges and syrups and a about two years after Bayer released it, they kind of realized it was way more addictive than they realized, and the heroin beast was unleashed. Now, they did pull it off of the market, but it was that was kind of its beginning. It was put out with the best of intentions, but it turned out to be a horrible thing. Okay, so finally we're going to talk a little bit about Mercury, one of my favorite elements. So Mercury um, is one of the only elements, I'm sorry, it is the only element that is a, a metal that is liquid at room temperature, which is pretty cool. Um, you can see the alchemical symbol in the middle there. And uh, it stands for, on the periodic table of elements, it has the um, HGs uh, is what it, uh, it's short too, and that's for hyd hydrogerium, which means water silver. It's also called quicksilver, which basically means living silver. Um, who here has actually you know, played with the broken thermometer with the mercury, right? Okay. Are you worried that you're going to die from it? <laughs> Hopefully not good. All right. And the good news is that, no, it wasn't dangerous when you were playing with it, but you chill, shouldn't have played with it. Um, and it is also the only element on the periodic table of elements that is named after a Roman god. And we will talk about that in just a little bit. So mercury um, has been used for quite a bit of time as a treatment for syphilis. Now I mentioned before how um, you know there were certain treatments that they wanted you to purge and have lots and lots of bowel movements because that would get the bile flowing, get rid of this extra bile. And um, mercury is one of those compounds that they use this for. So um, elemental mercury by itself, if you eat it, won't necessarily make you sick if you just take one dose. So there were these other types of compounds. There were salts, mercury salts. So mercurous chloride and mercuric chloride. Calomel is um, mercurous chloride. And there's a picture of that on the last slide there on the right. That's actually my bottle which also bought off the internet, because you buy everything on the internet. Um, so calomel, um, which means good and black, because that's what it makes your vowels look like, um, was the medicine of choice for so many different illnesses. You have the flu, you take calomel. You, um, you know, have a stomach ache, you take calomel. You're tired, you take calomel. Anything that made you purge, they said, was going to make you feel better. So here in this picture, this is a woodcut from 1689. You know, syphilis was a problem that plagued humans for quite a long time. Um, in this woodcut, it sort of shows how they are being treated for syphilis with different types of mercury. So the poor guy on the lower right is somebody suffering from secondary syphilis, so they've got this rash all over. Um, there is a person here who looks like he's in a barrel, and you can see his head is sticking out of the barrel, and underneath somebody's sticking something in there. So what they're doing is they're actually lighting a pan of elemental mercury on fire, over a fire, so it vaporizes the mercury, and so they're in a basically a mercury spa. And now, like I mentioned before, if you swallow a little bit of mercury, you will probably be okay. But mercury vapor, if you inhale it, or it's absorbed that way, is a lot more toxic because it's more easily absorbed into the system. Um, there's a poor guy up at the top, which you can kind of see is like spewing into like a waterfall <laughs> into a cup. Yes. So I mentioned the side effect that it can make you vomit or have diarrhea, but most of the time I think it was more like diarrhea. The thing with calomel and with some of these mercury compounds is that if you took enough of them, especially the salts, you absorbed enough of them that you would experience toxicity from the mercury. And some of the toxic effects, um, there were many different ones, you know, kidney problems, 
and you know rashes, your skin might peel off. Um, but copious salivation was a sign of mercury toxicity. So some people said if you weren't salivating a couple of pints of saliva from the mercury, then it wasn't working. You weren't taking enough. And so they basically equated mercury toxicity with effective dose. Okay, so Benjamin Rush, one of our founding fathers, had really forward-thinking thoughts about women and uh, psychiatry. Unfortunately, also believed in a type of medicine that was called heroic medicine. And this was, it was called heroic, heroic because they were basically pushing the body to these limits that were really, really um, extreme. And so he would do a combination of um, bloodletting and using calomel to purge in order to treat yellow fever victims in the late 1700s. Uh, it got to the point where you know his front lawn was just buzzing with flies from all the blood and the and the diarrhea, and his patients were dying left and right. But he really believed he firmly believed that he was doing the right thing, and. Um, while he was doing this, he had a lot of colleagues, um, including Alexander Hamilton, who were like, you know, he has his heart in the right place, but this is quackery. Like, what he's doing is just not, not right. So um, he was actually the person, the medical person in charge of the um, Lewis and Clark expedition. So he was the person who gave them a big list. These are all the medicines you need to take. These are the things you need to be aware of when you, you're out there. So if you get sick, this is what you do. And being somebody who was gung-ho about purgatives, he asked them to bring these 500 pills of what were called Ms. Dr. Rush's thunderbolts or thunderclappers. And they're called that because you can imagine what they do to your bowels when you take them. And they had a combination of calomel and jalap, which is this really potent um, vegetable purgative. So the interesting story about this is that you know Lewis and Clark's expedition was um, a military one. So they had this military blue book, and they had to do everything by the book wherever they camped and that sort of thing. And we do know the, um, the path that Lewis and Clark took across the United States, but it was for a long time they didn't know exactly where was the actual spot where they camped. You know, we knew they were on this river, we knew they took this trail, but where did they camp? Well, um, apparently um, in Montana, they actually found a spot where they were digging around and they did some, I think some like um, dating on some lead samples, and they were pretty sure that there was a cook site there, like a campfire. Um, now, according to the, um, the military blue book, you have to have latrines like X number of feet away from the campsite. And so they tested the soil like in a radial pattern, X number of feet away from that, um, where they thought the cook site was, and they basically hit a scatological bingo. They found huge quantities of mercury in the ground in a particular place, and so they were pretty sure that Lewis and Clark literally squatted there in Lolo, Montana. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so last slide here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Mercury the God and some of the ramifications of his legacy. So, um, Mercury is often seen in paintings holding a rod, um, and it's uh, called the caduceus. You probably maybe you've heard of it. It is a rod that has two snakes on it with wings, right? Um, now, a lesser-known rod is the rod of Asclepius, which is a single rod with a one snake around it. Now, the, now Asclepius is the Greek god of health and healing, and um, Mercury is a messenger god, but he's also known as the god of thieves and trickery. <laughs> so, in uh, 1902. Um, the Army Medical Corps decided that they were going to make their emblem, and they said, well, we're going to use the rod of Asclepius, you know, because he's the, the, the god of health and healing. But they, they picked the wrong rod, so they put the, rod, the caduceus on there. And since then, because they made that mistake, a lot of people just saw it, just assumed it was the right one. And so occasionally, if you go out into the community, you'll see um, some sort of, like, you know, healthcare sign that has the caduceus on it, and you can go tell them, you've got the wrong thing out there. That is the... That is, 
representative of thieves and trickery and, and, and all sorts of bad things. On the right side, you'll see the emblem of the World Health Organization, and it has the correct rod of Asclepius on there. But I just think it's a, a fitting way to sort of end. You know, we have practitioners who are trying to do the right thing, and then we also have medical quackery, and unfortunately, we have this guy who would probably would have been the patron saint of medical quackery. Now, um, I want to just take a moment to also reflect back on a lot of the stuff that's in this book and the things that I've spoken today. Some of them are very overt quackery, people who are trying to make a buck off of you that do not have your best intentions. And a lot of these forefathers of ours, and, you know, Hippocrates and Galen and Celsus and Paracelsus, they really truly believed that they were doing the right things when they were offering up these horrible treatments. And so, you know, we don't really consider those quacks. You know, this came under the umbrella of quackery, but this is really more of through the lens of the modern day, when we look back, what do we consider to be so outrageous that if it was presented to us now, we would say absolute quackery, and I'm definitely not doing that. So I hope you enjoyed the talk today. I'm going to leave you on this one last note here. It says, Frank started to get a funny feeling that his doctor was a quack. <laughs> but my co-author, Nate Peterson, is you can find him on Twitter, and you can also find me on uh, my website, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight on this cold, chilly, Florida evening. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much.